coffee, um, which means that you need to do it within the first five minutes. And, uh, and then, uh, just if, in, in case it, it wasn't clear, I know we've got like a massive auditorium here, and it's, it's very difficult to know where's what, but uh, the lavatory, also known as the toilets or the bathrooms, is just over there, uh, in case that wasn't clear enough. All right, so, uh, so guys, we, we've got load shedding, I'm not sure if you've noticed, um, and we've turned it into a very romantic evening, and there's nothing more romantic than listening to an American history professor uh, talk about human dignity uh, over a candlelit uh, um, coffee. All right, so we'll even play soft Enya music in the background as Richard takes us uh, through his, his talk this evening. Okay, so a couple of announcements, and then um, I'm going to invite Marcus to just uh, lead us in worship. So uh, the announcements. Let's see. All right, so, so the book launch. Um, guys, there's... There's, there's actually no easy way of saying it, but this is like a super impressive church. I mean, I'm not sure if you've noticed by looking at these water leaks in the roof and, and etc. And we've got published authors here, like Louise Mabil, who's, who's standing there in front. Actually, she's sort of part of my PowerPoint. Um, and she contributed to this uh, book, Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. Voldu, who is either here or supposed to be here, he contributed as well. And Dennis Alexander, he's a biologist from, from Cambridge University. He's the editor of the book. And he's going to be here on the 14th of September. And we're going to have our little book launch. So who of you have ever been to a book launch before? Um, who's never been to a book launch? All right. So it's very easy, Pitain. What you do is you get a different shirt, and, and you, you come, and you must just look very snobbish and very uppity up. And uh, they, there will be a bit of wine, and there will be a cheese, and then um, everybody must just speak slightly uh, like this. Um, and hesitate a, a, a little bit more before they actually say a word. And then you're sort of perfect for your book launch. Okay, so, so that's the book launch, and that is on the 14th of September, and you know that something is serious when you have to RSVP. So please RSVP. And you're going to RSVP to Anna, who is somewhere. All right. Or you can just Anna at dialogue.org.za, and that will RSVP you. All right. Then the next one, on the 24th of September, it's Heritage Day. And, uh, and on Heritage Day, we're teaming up with the church in Mamalodi. We do a lot of things with them. Sabu has spoken here a couple of times. We've played a lot of soccer games against them, which, wasn't, which didn't end that well. But we are going to go at it again. So on the 24th, uh, Sabu and everybody's going to be here. Why? One of the reasons why I'm excited about this is because we're going to sing in all the languages, maybe with the exception of sign language, that we, uh, all, all the languages in South Africa. And it's going to be sort of a mashup of the different worship teams, and, and I'm quite excited about that. And we're only going to have the morning service, and after that we're going to have a braai, and then we're going to play some soccer. But it's going to be a proper day it's going to be a heritage day. Okay, are you guys with me? Can't really see if I'm getting any response, but the 24th of September, that is what you have to do. Okay, and then next up is, uh, it, it, it's our talk tonight, but before we do that, I just want to punt one of our other activities that's, that's, not, that's not on here, and that is on the, is it the 1st of October? Um, where is Anna now? The Faith and Reason, 1st of October, right? Ah, okay. So the 30th of September, we have our Faith and Reason conference. Has anybody here heard of a, a guy called Craig Keener? Who's uh, Craig Keener? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so Craig Keener will be here. He is considered to be one of the, the best charismatic uh, theologians out there, and he's done a monumental work on miracles. It's, it's really uh, like a weapon, and 
multiple volumes, and he's going to present a little bit on some of his modern miracle claims that he's investigated. Um, but this guy is, is, is really, really smart, and I can, I can recommend it. So he's going to uh, present on miracles on the, the, at the Faith and Reason conference, as well as his wife, Medin Kina, um, who's also a theologian. She's a Congolese, as a matter of fact, so she's going to present. And uh, then there is a South African theologian who's also going to speak, whose name is Stefan Jubert. All right, Stefan Jubert, also known as Stefan Jubert. And he's going, to, he's going to present alongside Craig and Medin. And then the following evening, uh, Craig and Medin Kina will be speaking here on racial reconciliation. And he's written a massive book. Well, it's not that massive, like 200 pages, but he's, he's written a good book on uh, the role of Africa in, uh, uh, in, in the early days of, of the church. And he's going to talk a little bit about that and about ethnic reconciliation, etc. So I know I'm not showing you flyers right now, but I'm assuming you guys can, can remember that. It's the last, the last day in September, which is the Saturday, and on the Sunday, he's going to speak here. All right, that's it from me. Okay, lacquer. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer, and then I'll pray for us and get us going. After, after my prayer... Marcus will come up and uh, lead us in, in worship. And then after the set, I will introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Wycott. All right. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can be here this evening. We thank you for the, the subtle change of season. Uh, we, we thank you for the fact that we've got all of these wonderful activities happening, and it's, it's just beautiful in the... Um, to, to see in the life of the, the church all of, of, of these people who are really trying to worship you with their minds. And we're excited about the book launch. We're excited about Dennis Alexander. We're excited about tonight with Professor Wycott. We're excited um, about the Faith and Reason Conference with, uh, with Craig and Medine Kina. So we thank you for the fact that we can worship you not only with our hearts, but also with our minds. And as we wrestle tonight with a very difficult topic, um, we ask you, Lord, that we will have open minds and open hearts to be receptive to what you have to say. Um, a lot of us here in the room are in different places. Some of us are maybe not really questioning anything. Some of us might be questioning everything. And I pray, Lord, that you will meet us where we are at, uh, that you will make us soft and make us receptive. And we also pray that you will be with Richard as he brings us his message. And uh, as he travels back to the U.S. tomorrow, we pray that you will uh, guide him in that as well. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we, we also think of those, the, the, the terrible incident in Johannesburg this past week where uh, people just burned alive in that, in that uh, building. And uh, Lord, uh, we, we really pray... On the one hand, that those families will be able to grieve well and that they would be able to persevere and that they would find you amidst the, 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 uh, just, just the horror of what happened there. But Lord, we also pray for our country and things like this that, that can be prevented, that is down to, uh, that, that can be uh, put at the feet of corruption or mismanagement or whatever the case may be, Lord. We pray, please, that, that this will be a wake-up call, that there would be proper intervention um, and that our beautiful country will really be a safe country for, for all. And, uh, yeah, especially Johannesburg that's gone through a rough patch as of late. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can celebrate the big things and that we can plead with you in terms of... Uh, these, these things that are close and some of it is far. Um, but all of these things we just put before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, please apologize for, or apologies for the slight buzz. Uh, it's just a generator. But um, I'm sure that as soon as we start worshiping, we can definitely buff that out. So let's get to our feet and let's praise and worship the Lord together. Lord 
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Cause you came from heaven to earth to show. cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us Cause you came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. As you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, bay, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost. It's grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, 
No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hands Till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Come, thou font of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy unchanging love. And here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy. And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interpose this precious blood Known to grace our greater debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love is my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts of Come thou font of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Calls for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song that Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount i fixed upon it Mount of thy unchanging love Amen I... So on YouTube not long ago, Marcus Mumford from Mumford & Sons doing this Come Thou Fount. And I just sent it to Marcus and I said, if you'd not sing this to us, you're fired. Uh, 
And it's just lovely. It's, it's, it's so special. Thanks, Anna, and thanks, Marcus. All right, I, I quickly want to introduce uh, Professor Wycott to you guys. And um, I'm going to do that through his Wikipedia page. Now, you know, you know that somebody is impressive when they've, when they've got their own Wikipedia page. So, uh, so, Professor, am I pronouncing it correctly, Wycott? Is it, is it Dutch? German. German. So it's actually Weikart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. In South Africa, we'll, we'll, we'll do it Weikart. And he is professor of history at California State University. He's an advocate of intelligent design and senior fellow of the Center of Science and Culture and Discovery Institute. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, you know, it, in, 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 uh, at Wikipedia, you get sort of that that section that makes it easier for us to just quickly go through your stuff. Um, so you are 65, it says here on the internet, and uh, known for historian of modern Germany, advocate of intelligent design, spouse, Lisa Weikart. Nothing is sacred anymore. Um, is that still true? Lisa, Lisa Weikart? What? Children, Joy, John, Joseph, Miriam, Christine, Hannah, and Sarah. Goodness me. Um, and then, uh, just, uh, he's smart. So can we just accept that? And then uh, he's most known for his book on, uh, let me read this. Wycott is best known for his 2004 book, From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. And uh, I really hope that you can, I mean, this is not the topic for tonight, but if you can touch a little bit on that, it would be, it would be amazing. Um, otherwise, we'll just have to cancel your flight tomorrow. Um, and uh, guys, it's, it's just a massive privilege to have somebody of Professor Wycott's uh, pedigree to come and speak to us. Um, can somebody maybe just go on Wikipedia and say, um, Professor Wycott uh, notably spoke at Dialogue Community in Pretoria. Um, calling it the pinnacle of his career. Uh, so, uh, what I, I, I just also want to thank John Grobler, who I'm not seeing at the moment, but he's from Apologetics SA. If you guys don't know it, Pretoria is the hub of apologetics in the world. It's a little bit like, I don't know, advertising is in New York, so it's a, it's a bit of a hub. And uh, Sasselberg is known for Sassel. In Pretoria, we do apologetics. So Apologetics SA is the one group, and they're bringing speakers. And then just as they go, uh, Rosho Christie will bring in another batch. And just as they go, we're constantly surrounded by Americans um, here in Pretoria. But we are, we are so glad that you guys were willing to share uh, Professor Wycott with us this, this evening. So thank you to Apologetics SA as well. You guys can just check them out online. Um, so without further ado, Professor Wycott, you are so welcome. He's going to um, talk to us on the image of God or a, uh, are, you a image of go are you the image of God or a cosmic accident? And then after that, we'll have some time for Q&A. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. It's great to be here with you tonight. Oh, okay, so I can. So I can okay, all right, sure, sure. Okay, great. Okay, it's great to be with you here tonight. And the question that we're going to we're posing here, you know, are you the image of God or a cosmic accident, is a, a question that many people are wrestling with in our society. And there's a spiritual battle going on over this issue of who we are as human beings. Uh, you've probably experienced this at some level or other in uh, society or culture. You, if, you, if you have any sense of, uh, if you've been through educational system, read media or anything, you'll, you'll see these kinds of things coming up again and again and again. And <clears throat> before I launch into this, because a lot of what I'm going to say today is sort of uh, trying to know your enemy, I want to point out that as we're engaging in uh, this spiritual struggle, that there's a, a spiritual struggle going on between truth and lies. And this is a, a struggle that's been going on since the time of Adam and Eve when they were first lied to by the devil. But it's something that we are also wrestling with today. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that sets itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that's what we're trying to do when we do Christian apologetics. We're trying to engage with truth in a way that tries to transform our own minds first so that we embrace the truth and then we're trying to speak that truth to others to try to bring that truth to others in our culture. And it's a spiritual battle that's going on. And so this, what I'm talking about today is sort of a, a, an element of trying to sort of know our enemies so that we can fight that spiritual battle more effectively because there is a spiritual battle over these issues going on. Okay, the, in, in thinking about the image of God, of course, from the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, we're instructed that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And because of this, Christianity, since its very inception, uh, has been opposed to uh, abortion, suicide, euthanasia, uh, and other kinds of ways of tearing down a human life and devaluing human life. And these prohibitions against abortion and euthanasia and infanticide and, and uh, assisted suicide have been in place in European and uh, American laws and many laws around the world, other places as well, uh, for until really the 1960s uh, when they began to be eroded, especially abortion first, but now we're facing more uh, with uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide coming in its train here now in the past couple of decades. Now, these ideas uh, uh, about Christian, the Christian view of being made in the image of God was very prominent in Western societies uh, until really the 18th to 19th century when intellectuals began to uh, chip away at it. But in one of the founding documents of the United States, we find, this, uh, we find this saying that embodies this notion of humans having particular value. I have it up for you on the screen if you want to watch the screen. I, have a few, I don't have a lot of slides, but I have a few if you want to take a look at them here occasionally. But it says, this is written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776 in the United States Declaration of Independence. And he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we see here that Jefferson is acknowledging a creator. He's acknowledging that we all as human beings are created equally before God, and that there are human rights, which includes, according to him, the right to life. And so these ideas uh, were going to be very powerful in European and American society uh, up through the 18th and 19th centuries even, but today they're under attack. And you probably know that, but let me just give you one example of this. Uh, a prominent Israeli historian named Yuval Noah Harari uh, wrote a best-selling book uh, in 2015, which was called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. And Harari is a very influential figure. Not only was his book best-selling, but he has very close connections with the World Economic Forum and with a lot of uh, economic leaders in the world. Uh, and in his book, Sapiens, Harari explicitly rejects those points that I spoke to you about the Declaration of Independence. He actually explicitly mentions the Declaration of Independence and he says that no, humans are not created. We just evolved. He says that we didn't evolve to be equal either. We evolved to be different. So he undermines human equality. He then says that because we're the product of these blind evolutionary processes that there are no such things as human rights which would include the right to life. And so he wants to replace with his own secular outlook, and when I use the word secular here today, I'm referring to people that are either atheists or agnostics. Uh, atheists, people who deny that God exists, 
Agnostics would be people generally who deny that we can know whether there is a God who exists. And so I'm going to use the word secular to encompass both of those positions because essentially it comes down to the same thing when you get down to uh, their philosophy relating to human rights, morality, uh, and religion and God and such. So here's what Harari says we should replace this American Declaration of Independence with or that sentence from it with. He said, quote, this is also from, still from his book, Sapiens, quote, so here is that line from the Declaration, American Declaration of Independence translated into biological terms. And of course, these are the terms he thinks are true since he, they're biological. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men evolved differently, that they are born with certain mutable characteristics, and that among these are life and the pursuit of pleasure. So here, notice life isn't an inalienable right, as Thomas Jefferson wrote, uh, but rather uh, they are what he calls mutable characteristics, just characteristics that can change over time. So they don't really have any uh, ultimate value or significance. So he, that's, so there in sort of short compass, I've laid out to you sort of what the battle is. It's between this view that human life has value and the notion that humans are simply a product of accidental events that have taken place over eons of time, and therefore we don't have any particular value any more than anything else in the cosmos. And I'll spell this out a little bit more, too, as we go through and I talk about some of these issues. But what I want to do tonight is I want to uh, sort of give us some ways of thinking to push back against this notion, to be able to... You know, speak life to our culture of death that's out there. And I'm going to make a philosophical argument here tonight, which is building upon two premises, and then I will draw a conclusion from those premises. And I've got it laid out for you here on the, the thing, but I'll read it here for you. My first premise is that if God does not exist, then human life has no intrinsic value no transcendent meaning, no purpose, and no objective moral significance. Okay, that's my first premise. And I'm going to unpack these in just a second, so bear with me here. The second premise is that human life does have intrinsic value, transcendent meaning, purpose, and objective moral significance. And the conclusion to that, which has to follow, if you believe those two premises, the conclusion that has to follow is, therefore, God exists. Now, of course, this argument depends on being able to prove the premises, get people to agree with the premises to the argument. So let me talk about the two premises here uh, just a little bit. And, you know, again, I'm trying to aim at this in a way that we can try to share with our non-Christian friends, associates, family, and everything, too, to try to uh, push uh, these uh, or to try to deal with these particular issues when we, we confront them, when we have opportunity uh, to speak with our non-Christian friends about these issues. Well, interestingly, premise one, I think, is the least controversial of the two. Uh, premise one, that if God does not exist, then human life does not have intrinsic value, transcendent meaning, purpose, or objective moral significance, is even for secular thinkers, most of them will readily admit that. Because it doesn't seem like there's really anything that could give human life any kind of objective moral significance or purpose or meaning if there isn't a God. God sort of underpins that, and certainly as Christians, we believe that. And indeed, if you read writings by prominent atheists and agnostics and such, many of them will make exactly that argument. They will argue that if God does not exist, and of course they think he doesn't, but they'll say, if God doesn't exist, then human life does not have any particular meaning, purpose, or value. Uh, if you read the writings, for example, I'll just give you a few examples here. But if you read the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, the very famous German philosopher of the 19th century, the one who is famous for his God is dead statement, Nietzsche made exactly this point. Nietzsche said, if God doesn't exist, then neither do morals, neither, do, neither does value of human life exist. Those that followed Nietzsche into the so-called existentialist movement in the early to mid part of the 20th century, uh, likewise, we're going to make similar kinds of arguments. Sartre, a French existentialist in the mid 20th century, said that life is absurd. There is no ultimate meaning, no ultimate purpose. 
to life. It's just absurd. And Camus is going to agree with that as well. But not, it's not just these irrationalist thinkers like the existentialists who embrace that. The scientific materialists will argue the exact same thing. Uh, people like uh, Jerry Coyne, a prominent evolutionary biologist at the uh, University of Chicago. He's a very prominent atheist in the United States. Uh, and he argues very forthrightly that humans have no more purpose. In one of, the, one of his uh, blogs, he said that humans have no more purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo. So there's no purpose and meaning to human life. Richard Dawkins has said that same thing uh, as well. He said very clearly that he doesn't think that human life has any particular meaning or purpose because we're just the chance of these, uh, we're just, excuse me, we're just the product of these chance events that have taken place over time. Here's an, I'll give you one more key example from the, among these scientific materialists. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, who's a prominent astrophysicist in the United States, he wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing. He said in one of his uh, writings, speaking about humans, he said, we are just a bit of pollution. If you got rid of us and all the stars and all the galaxies and all the planets and all the aliens and everybody, then the universe would be largely the same. We're completely irrelevant. So that's his view of uh, the value of humanity. There is no value, ultimately, in his view, which is why he says we're just a bit of pollution. So he even gives sort of a negative value even there, right? Because pollution is, is negative. So uh, he sees humans as not having any particular value or moral significance. When he talks about things like morality, uh, he said that love is just the firing of neurons and biochemical reactions. That's all love is. There's no, no reality to it outside of your biological makeup. Interestingly, he did, however, think that science could tell us something about morality, but it's very interesting if, what he thinks it can say about morality. He said at one point, I think that science can either modify or determine our moral convictions. The fact that infidelity, for example, is a fact of biology must, for any thinking person, and I guess I don't qualify as a thinking person because I don't agree with his point here, <laughs> but he says this must, for any thinking person, modify any absolute condemnation of it. So infidelity, cheating on your spouse, that's just a fact of nature. It's just something that happens, and so because of that, we can't condemn it. It's, it's okay. It's, it's acceptable morally then. And he thinks that's what science is teaching us. Uh, so undermining any kind of Judeo-Christian morality. Now these ideas about this undermining of a human value gets reflected in a lot of different ways, and here's one that sort of reflected in some popular culture, although on, only under a small uh, number of people here. Uh, people for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, an animal rights group, put on this display in Europe uh, several years ago called Holocaust on Your Plate, and I have the, the display for you, a picture of it up there. And on the left side of that display, you have a picture of Jews in Nazi concentration camps. On the right side, you have chickens in a cage. And the caption to it says, to animals, all people are Nazis. So it's drawing an equivalence here between human, we're just animals, humans and animals, we're all the same. There's no moral difference. They can't distinguish morally between human beings and animals. And that's where we're at in a lot, among a lot of secular thinkers today. Okay, but as I've said, most secular thinkers will agree with us with that first premise I had. If God does not exist, but of course they take the opposite view, they think he doesn't exist, then human life has no value. Premise two, I think, is a little trickier. Premise two was that, uh, that human life does have value and meaning and moral significance. Uh, and so this one is going to be ultimately relying upon intuitions that are not totally provable, which is true, by the way, of a lot of philosophical arguments. But I think there's a couple of ways we can get at uh, this premise to try to demonstrate it, even to people who may disagree up front with that position. First of all, I think we can try to show the inconsistencies of people that believe uh, in this worldview. And secondly, I think we can illustrate the horrible consequences that flow from people who do take this, these views seriously. So let me talk about both of those separately. Let's start off by looking at the inconsistencies. 
In my book, Death of Humanity, I actually bring out a lot of inconsistencies that I've discovered over the course of studying about the issues of do human lives have value and moral significance? Because a lot of the people that deny that can't really live that way. A lot of people that deny that make all sorts of other kinds of statements that show that they really do have some acknowledge some value of human life. They don't really think that human life is completely meaningless uh, and purposeless. And one of the most fascinating examples I found of this as I was studying uh, for my book was Bertrand Russell, who was one of the most prominent philosophers of the 20th century in Britain. Bertrand Russell, uh, in his philosophy, claimed that human life has no particular meaning, purpose, or value. Here's a, a quote, and this is, by the way, just one sentence, very long sentence, uh, but I'm going to read this for you because I think it gives a sense of how he views humanity. Russell said that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. So we're just the product of these accidental ways that atoms have arranged themselves over time. And then he goes on to say that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, so he denies any life after death, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. So in other words, the universe is going to die out someday and everything is going to be extinguished with it. Nothing is going to last. And then he goes on to say, all these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. So Russell thought these things were so obvious and self-evident that any philosophy that wanted to you know, participate in uh, the intellectual world had to embrace these views, that nothing planned the world. There was no design or plan to anything. He said that at the very beginning of this. There's no uh, life after death. Uh, there's, everything's going to ultimately be destroyed. That's what that's where we stand. And so what implications does this then have for human life? Well, I think you can already figure this out, but let me read you another quote from him that, where he does spell this out even in a little more detail, what this means for human life. He said, quote, The philosophy of nature must not be unduly terrestrial, for it, the Earth, is merely one of the smaller planets of one of the smaller stars of the Milky Way. It would be ridiculous to warp the philosophy of nature in order to bring out results that are pleasing to the tiny parasites of this insignificant planet. Now, did you catch what Russell called us in this talk? We're just parasites. He's talking about people here. He's saying we're just the parasites of this planet, this insignificant planet even. Uh, <clears throat> Interestingly, however, if you look, delve a little deeper into Russell's thinking, his uh, activities and such, there's, a, a, there's something that sort of divulges that he wasn't really comfortable with his own worldview. There's some contradictions that emerge here. Uh, and just for example, uh, Russell was an intense moralist. He claimed overtly, when you talked about his philosophy of morality and such, he said morality is just a feeling. There's nothing objective about it. There's nothing beyond ourselves. It's just a feeling that you have. But at the same time, he was intensely moralistic. In fact, his daughter wrote a book called My Life with Bertrand Russell. And in that book, she says that. She says this was contradicting his whole philosophy, that his own devotion to morality just contradicted what he taught about what morality really is. He even spent time in jail. Uh, for his pacifist convictions. Uh, okay, I'll skip that one there. So here's a book the uh, co-authored with Albert Einstein uh, promoting pacifism. He was, uh, he was promoting nuclear disarmament and he spent time in jail because of his protests against those things. But one of the things that really amazed me when I was doing my research and finding out about Russell was in the early 20th century he wrote a letter to a woman that he was in love with. And in this letter, he sort of bears his soul in a way that he doesn't do publicly. And one thing I think that's interesting about this is that it sort of gives me hope sometimes when I'm sharing with people that may be atheists or agnostics 
or skeptics of Christianity because Russell on the outside and in his professional life was making these arguments about human life having no particular value. But on the other hand, deep down, he seems to know better than that. And it's revealed here in this letter that I'm just going to read to you from. And I'm going to read you a pretty good section of it to you because it's really powerful what he describes here about what's going on and the wrestling that's going on in his own life. And here's what he said. He said, I am strangely unhappy because of the pattern of my life is complicated. Because my nature is hopelessly complicated. A mass of contradictory impulses. So R- R- Russell here recognizes it himself. He says it's, there's contradictory impulses. So it's not just me saying there was a contradiction in his, uh, in his life. Russell himself recognized that there was a contradiction in his life. And here's what he said that contradiction comes out of. He said, the center of me is always and eternally a terrible pain, a curious, wild pain, a searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite, the beatific vision, God. I do not, so there he uses the God word. He's searching for God, he says. But then here's what he says. He says, I do not find it. I do not think it is to be found. So there's his mind kicking in again. There's the contradiction. I'm searching and yearning for God, but his mind tells him, well, he doesn't really exist. So he he says, I do not find it. I do not think it is to be found, but the love of it is my life. It's like passionate love for a ghost, he said. And then he said, at times it fills me with rage, at times with wild despair. It is the source of gentleness and cruelty and work. It fills every passion that I have. It is the actual spring of life within me. So this yearning for God, this yearning for something transcendent, he said, that's what, that's what gives me life. That's the spring of life within me. And then he went on to say, I can't explain it or make it seem anything but foolishness because his mind had told him there is no such thing, right? There is no God. But then he said, but whether it's foolish or not, it is the source of whatever is any good in me. At most times now, I am not conscious of it. Only when I'm strongly stirred, either happily or unhappily. I seek escape from it, though I don't believe I ought to. He says, I'm trying to escape from it because his mind's telling him it doesn't happen, it doesn't exist. He says, I don't really think I ought to try to escape from it. So there's this contradiction going on within Russell. And he's, he's, he's struggling within himself. And, you know, when we talk to people you know, who may be skeptics, atheists, agnostics, or whatever, you know, we may not have, an, you know, on the surface, they may make these arguments, and they may talk about, you know, life being meaningless and all these other things. We don't know what's going on inside of them. And, you know, this sort of gives me encouragement that, you know, sometimes there's things going on inside that we might be able to tap into, and may the Spirit of God may be able to touch uh, and uh, bring life to them. Now, there's many other examples of this kind of uh, contradictions. Uh, Russell isn't the only one. Jerry Coyne, University of Chicago biologist, I think I may have mentioned him already briefly here. He said that life has no overarching meaning and purpose. He said evolution, we have no more extrinsic purpose than a squirrel and an armadillo. I think I I already referenced that to you. But But then he does seem to think that human life does have value. When people criticize Darwinism for some atrocities that have been committed in the name of Darwinism, he will get very upset with that. Why? Because he knows that those human lives that were snuffed out in that mass murder or whatever it was, he knows that those lives have value more than a squirrel or an armadillo. He doesn't get upset when squirrels and armadillos are getting hunted, but he does get upset about humans being killed. Also, interestingly, Coyne Although Coyne claims that morality is just an evolved phenomenon, on the other, which then would give it no objective uh, validity, he then argues in his book, you know, Faith versus Fact, that sec- his secular morality that he's promoting, he says, is superior to religious morality, like Christian morality. But wait a minute, Jerry Coyne, if one morality can be higher or greater or superior to another morality, that means there's some objective morality outside of both of those by which you're measuring 
those or some measuring stick outside of them which can tell you that this one is superior to the other. So there's these contradictions in his thought that I think we as Christians can try to point to and try to uh, deal with. Then another key thinker who's been very influential uh, in the 20th and early 21st centuries uh, is Peter Singer, especially on this issue of the value of human life, because Peter Singer is a bioethicist. He's, in fact, probably the most famous bioethicist in the world today. He's originally from Australia. He, did a lot of, he spent a lot of his career in Australia as a philosopher, but then he has an endowed chair at Princeton University in the United States now. Uh, and he does not believe that human life is intrinsically valuable. In fact, I actually debated him on the radio show Unbelievable out of London uh, on this very issue. The, very, the question that we debated was, is human life intrinsically valuable? And I took the positive position, and Singer took the negative position. <clears throat> Singer only thinks that some people have value, uh, but he thinks other people do not. And he divides humanity into two different kinds of people. Person, what he calls persons, and non-persons. So what is it that gives a person, or what is it that makes a person, uh, a human being a person rather than a human being that's not a person? Singer thinks it's rationality and ability to, and self-consciousness and ability to plan uh, the future, and that's what gives humans moral significance. I actually challenged him on that particular point as to why he thought nat rationality was morally significant, because after all, rationality is just a product of evolutionary processes according to his worldview. Uh, and he couldn't really give me an answer. In fact, he actually didn't give me a basis for it, which I was kind of astonished because that's really the whole basis of how he divides humans into persons and non-persons, and he couldn't give me a, a reason why the trait that he thought was most important, rationality, uh, really had any kind of moral significance. So, okay, so this, that's the first way I think we can tackle this issue. Look at the, the uh, contradictions in the thinking of people who do this, because most people at some level understand that human life has value, even if they deny it overtly. And here's where I think Romans 1 is so uh, good to meditate on and think about because it, it deals with a, a wider issue than just the value of human life. It's dealing with the issue of nature and creation and such. But I think it's applicable here uh, that people don't want to embrace the truth. That's the problem. But deep down, they know that human life has value. Let me just read to you Romans 1, because I think it's apropos here. Romans 1, verses 18 through 25 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And that includes, uh, and Brian Miller and others, uh, my colleagues, have looked at things relating to nature and how nature exhibits design and such, but it also, I think, it refers to our conscience within us as well. And Paul actually talks about that in the next couple of chapters of Romans uh, as well. We know internally that human life has value, that there's moral, there's morality and such, but it says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Then he goes on in verse 20 to say, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Why? It's not because they didn't know better. They did know better, but they don't want to know better. They don't want to embrace that truth. And I think that's kind of what we're facing also in this particular fight over the value of human life. Okay, the second key point I said I was going to make to try to uh, established my second premise is looking at the horrible consequences of, uh, that flow from people who do take seriously the devaluing of human life. Now, some people, by the way, will object to this and say, well, you know, not many secularists are very kindly 
caring people, and that's true. But they didn't get their kindliness and caringness from their philosophy. It doesn't really fit there. And there are many people who have taken their philosophy seriously who have not been so kindly uh, and loving and compassionate. So, for example, if we think about uh, the, some of the philo secular philosophies that have taken control of regimes in the world. We have communist regimes that have taken over, Marxist regimes that have taken over in many countries of the world, Russia, the, uh, China, uh, and many others. And over the course of the 20th century, we have had the death of 100 million people come about through those communist regimes. 100 million lives perished because the Marxists do not value human life. They think some human lives have more value than others, and if you happen to be in the wrong category, then you're disposable. And so this notion that human life has no value has led to uh, mass murder in Marxist regimes. It's also led to mass murder in the, the uh, German, whoops, I forgot to show you that one. It also led to mass murder, of course, in Nazi Germany. This is a sh shot showing you mass graves at one of their so-called euthanasia facilities where they killed Germans with disabilities. Over 10,000 were killed at that particular facility in Hadamar, Germany. Uh, and so uh, Hitler and his fellow Nazis didn't have any concern about the value of human life. Again, they thought the, some humans had value, the Aryans or Nordic, but others didn't. Uh, and so uh, they only valued some human lives. <clears throat> But more recently, we've seen uh, episodes, too, within uh, Western society where people have uh, committed mass murder on a smaller scale, but also driven by these kind of secular philosophies. Uh, two rather dramatic uh, examples of this, uh, one from the United States and one from Finland, uh, is Eric Harris, who in 1999 shot up his high school in Colorado. Uh, he was wearing a t-shirt that said natural selection. That's actually not a photograph of him. It's from a film reconstruction. But he was wearing a t-shirt that said natural selection when he carried out his murders because he loved Darwinism and he thought that what he was doing was helping uh, evolution along. Uh, he also, by the way, interestingly, uh, conducted that uh, mass killing on April 20th, which is Hitler's birthday. Uh, and so there's a connection there between the, the Darwinism and the, the neo-Nazism, uh, which I've talked about in some other writings that I've done, especially my latest book uh, called uh, Darwinian Racism. So uh, Eric Harris, in his journal that he was writing before he carried out his mass murder, and he died in the course of that, uh, so he, he wasn't able to say anything afterwards, but in his journal, uh, he made clear that his worldview was based upon his understanding of science and nature and such. Uh, he said at one point, for example, there's no such thing as true good or true evil. It's all relative to the observer. It's just all nature, chemistry, and math. And then he said, just because your mommy and daddy told you blood and violence is bad, you think it's a law of nature? Wrong. Only science and math are true. Everything, and I mean everything else, is man-made. So he thought that what he was doing was consistent with this worldview of it's all about science and math and human life has no value, there's no morality, there's no evil, you know, uh, and so violence is okay. Uh, Pekka Eric Ovinen, the other person in the thing there with the t-shirt on, and that, by the way, is a photo, that is a screenshot of him. He did a YouTube video just before he shot up his high school in 2007. Uh, and Ovinen was wearing a t-shirt, humanity is overrated. Uh, he also loved Darwinism, by the way. One of his cyber nicknames was Natural Selector. And he stated in his manifesto, humans are just a species among other animals, and the world does not exist only for humans. Death and killing is not a tragedy. It happens in nature all the time between all species. Not all human lives are important or worth saving. So that was the worldview that was driving him uh, to commit this horrible act. Now, of course, many secularists will uh, interject here. Well, you know, these guys, they would think, well, these guys are just crazy. They're nuts. Most uh, seculars, most atheists, agnostics are not like that. They're kind and good uh, people and such. But what I would submit to you is that 
uh, although there is some truth to that and a good deal of truth to that, in our society we are wrestling with issues that have to do with the value of human life and that secular philosophies has opened the way to what some people refer to today as our culture of death that is resulting in far more deaths than uh, the communists or the Nazis could have even imagined. Uh, since the 1970s, for example, uh, and it's hard to get exact statistics on this, but since the 1970s, when abortion has become legal in mo many parts of the world, the worldwide uh, statistics for abortion are somewhere much higher than one billion children being killed. It's over 50 million per year now, worldwide. 50 million per year babies are being killed. So this devaluing of human life is having tragic consequences uh, that go even far beyond what uh, these, these people shooting up their high schools uh, could think of. And then since, the abor since abortion has been uh, legalized in many parts of the world, uh, most parts of the world, uh, we now are wrestling with issues relating to infanticide. There are bioethicists today, uh, including Peter Singer, whom I mentioned earlier, who are promoting infanticide, that uh, after they're being born, we can kill them. In fact, some, bi some uh, bioethicists are calling this afterbirth abortion. And the way they reason, they say, well, we kill them before they're born, why don't we just kill them after they're born? There's not that much difference between them uh, uh, after they're born, before they're born. And Peter Singer has said that human, newborn infants are not persons because they don't have the high enough levels of rationality, he thinks, to qualify as persons. And so he thinks we can dispense with them. So abortion is then moving now to infanticide. We're also uh, embracing in many parts of the world now uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and more recently, uh, Spain, Austria, Germany have legalized assisted suicide and euthanasia, as have most of the Australian states, as has Canada, as has ten, ten states in the United States uh, have uh, legalized assisted suicide as well. And so these are sort of the fronts that we are, are the biggest fronts in terms of us as Christians confronting this devaluing of human life that has gone on from uh, the... Uh, secular thinkers uh, who are trying to uh, tear down this idea that human life has value and that there is any kind of right to life or any kind of moral uh, values at all. Now, let me close here by note noting that, you know, trying to bring this back to the issue of the spiritual battle that I talked about at the very beginning. Because in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul is talking about the spiritual battle that we're in, he said we need to put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles means tricks, lies, deceit. So the devil's trying to lie to us and he's trying to get us to believe his lies and that's how he's going to defeat us if we allow him to. But we need to fight against that. And how does Paul say we're supposed to fight against that? Well, in Ephesians 6, where he talks about the armor of God that we're to take up to stand against the devil, the first part of the armor is the belt of truth. Truth. That's how we stand up against the lies of the devil. We have to embrace truth. Now, truth, by the way, is more than just you know, intellectual concepts, too. I need to emphasize this, too. If you go through Scripture and look at the word truth... You know, Jesus is the truth. So truth is about relating to Jesus. It says, Jesus, when he talked about sending the Holy Spirit, he called him the spirit of truth. And so it's being filled with the spirit is a way to get truth into our being. So the first part of the armor of God, he says, the belt of truth. The last part that he mentions is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And Jesus had already said in John 17 when he was praying his high priestly prayer to God before he went uh, to the cross, he's praying for his disciples and he said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And so when we're talking about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, once again, it's the truth that we're bringing to bear in this spiritual battle. 
And as I'm suggesting, there's two ways this needs to work itself out in our lives. First of all, we need to make sure that we're getting rid of any of the lies and deception that's in our own minds, in our own ways of thinking about things. And so this is going to require some uh, spending time with God. By the way, if you want to, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Jesus being the truth, you know, peer pressure is a very powerful thing, right? I'm sure you all know that. Uh, but if you want to, because we tend to become like the people that we hang around with. And so, if you want to become and become like truth and have truth, you know, filling your life, spend time with Jesus because he is the truth. So spend time with him. Spend time with the Holy Spirit, you know, and get that truth in your heart. So the first place is here. But then after that, then we have the sword of the Spirit, an offensive weapon that we can then speak out to bring the truth to our culture of death that we're a part of here today. So we need to use that in whatever venue God gives us. Again, we need to rely upon the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth and to how we speak this truth to others. Obviously, we need to speak it in a loving way of trying to rescue people from the lies that are, are destroying their lives and the lives of others. But nonetheless, we need to speak the truth to our society and culture in ways that we can bring life back to our culture. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've shown us and taught us. We thank you that you are the truth, and we pray that you would come now and dwell in our hearts by faith. Lord, we pray that you'll teach us, that you'll remove any deception that's still in our lives, that you'll help us to embrace reality and truth, and that, God, you'll give us ways to uh, speak truth to our friends, and neighbors, family, uh, and all the people we associate with. God, please use us in the work of your kingdom and help us to uh, bring other people to understand and to know you the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It's been great to be with you tonight. Well, anyone who would use what some people refer to as the dominion mandate, that's what some people call this, that we've been given dominion over the uh, animals and plants and the earth. Anyone who would use that to try to argue that we can thus abuse and uh, trash the earth is not really reading it very carefully and is just using it for their own selfish uh, purposes. They're not reading very carefully what it actually says because what it says is that God gave them dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and, the, and all the animals and, and such so that they could care for it and keep it. That word's used there, keep it. 
You know, we're not to be destroying it, trashing it, demolishing this earth. We're supposed to be taking care of it. And so the dominion mandate is supposed, we are supposed to be functioning in this dominion mandate in the same way that, God, as, as basically as God's proxy, so to speak, under God's ultimate authority, in the same way that God exercises dominion over us. Not destroying us, not to abuse us, God exercises dominion out of love and out of the, for the good of those that are under his authority. And the same thing is supposed to be true of us under our authority. And not just the, the, plant, the plants and the animals and the, the earth, but also other people that we happen to have authority over. You know, if we happen to have authority over other people in various ways, and many people do as parents or as teachers or as uh, working in some company or whatever, you may have people under your authority. As Christians, we're supposed to be using that authority to be a blessing to them and to help them and not to oppress them and push them down. And the same thing is true with the earth. Thanks for having me.